First off, you should know that Washington State has some of the cleanest air in the United States. That's good. We do get the air off the Pacific Ocean, which is relatively clean. So most of the time, these pollutants are pretty well scrubbed out of the air over the Pacific, but not every day. Some days, they'll be, if you will, depending on what the weather patterns, there'll be wafts of this pollution that we can detect coming in from Asia. Uh, and on a few days a year, maybe five days a year, we will get a significant slug of this pollution that comes in from Asia and can contribute to our own air pollution. And the way I think of this is it's, we have our own air pollution, and then this air pollution comes in and adds to that. And what we breathe is the sum of all of that pollution. Now, at the same time, over the last 20 years, something that's been happening in the United States as a result of uh, rules from the Environmental Protection Agency is our air quality standards have gotten tighter and tighter and tighter. Scientific information has shown that air pollutants affect your health, especially elderly and babies, but everybody, at lower and lower concentrations. And so EPA has been lowering the standards, making them tougher and tougher and tougher. And what that means is now, as we lower the standards, we have to be concerned not only with our own local pollution, but also with pollution that comes in from other places. So there's been a huge amount of interest in this, and not just for Washington, but also how does what we call this background air, it's the air that comes into all of the United States, and as that air gets a little bit dirtier, remember it's clean already, but as it gets a little bit dirtier, it makes it harder for Cleveland to meet their air quality standards. It makes it harder for Los Angeles to meet their air quality standards. And so whether we're talking about ozone or particulate matter or mercury or per persistent organics like pesticides, all of these things we've now detected in the air coming out of the Pacific from Asia. And the critical piece of information is how much is coming in from these sources compared to how much is our own and where the standards are. We had some hunches that pollution could get transported long distances. Uh, some other scientists working at, actually out of Africa had used satellite information to show that pollutants could get transported thousands of kilometers. And one of the things that we noticed, of course, was that uh, our upstream neighbors in, uh, in Asia were starting to really rapidly develop and grow. And so I asked the question, was there any possibility that we could see these pollutants coming all the way over to the United States? And uh, as a scientist does, we develop a hypothesis and we design an experiment and we think about how we could test that hypothesis. We went out to what we thought would be one of the cleanest places in the Northern Hemisphere, out on the tip of Washington State, where the air comes in off the Pacific Ocean, to see if we could detect any traces of these pollutants coming in from Asia. Make a long story short, we did. We detected those pollutants. Uh, we were able to detect pollutants coming from industry, things like carbon monoxide and ozone and aerosols. Um, and that got people's interest and attention. That work was very widely covered and it really woke people up to the possibility that pollution could get transported thousands of kilometers. One of the, one of the biggest uh, concerns is that we know that Asia has been the most rapidly growing economies in the world. Uh, especially China has been growing 8 to 10 percent for the last 10 years. Enormously rapid growth going on in those countries. Now, they're not doing anything we didn't do. They're developing along the same lines with industry and electricity and cars that we did. But there's over a billion people in China. So as they do this and as they develop very rapidly, we now know that their emissions from their industries and their cars are increasing very rapidly on the order of 10% a year. Well, at 10% a year, that means you double the amount of emissions in only about seven years. So in just a seven-year period, the amount of pollution coming out of China is, is doubling. So there's a very strong ramp up to this. And so the, our expectation is that the amount of this pollution that's coming in from other countries, especially China, is going to double every seven years. That's a, that's a real concern. So now we have to think about how can we engage our international partners in agreements so that we can say, OK, maybe this isn't in everyone's best interest. Of course, remember, they also have very bad air quality in many of these Chinese cities. And so you'd like to think about some way to partner so that, that we can make a win-win out of it, while at the same time, they are still going to develop.
So there's very strong international component to this. Well, we started out at this site out in the tip of Washington State, a place called Chica Peak, which is a little hill out right on the coast of Washington. It's a beautiful place out on the Macaw Reservation, out near Nia Bay. Uh, we go out there, we bring a lot of different sophisticated instruments. We have to test the instruments in the lab, we do calibrations on the instrument. So we're constantly testing this instrument to making sure our data is, is really good. Then we bring the instruments out in the field and we connect them to computers or different kinds of data loggers and we let them run for weeks at a time. All that time we're collecting the data. And then we'll use meteorological data, winds, we'll use weather models, we'll use satellite data to try to put the whole story together. Now, it's not just me. There's a lot of students involved in this. I have undergraduates and graduate students and postdoctoral fellows, all of which are doing different parts. Of, and what we ultimately do is we try to put that story together so that the different pieces come together and we're telling the whole story. I would say about three quarters of the measurements we do are off-the-shelf instruments, and about one quarter where we have to really uh, develop the analytical methodologies ourselves. Um, right now, for example, we have an instrument to measure mercury for an aircraft. Uh, as far as I know, it's the only one in the world. Uh, it's to measure the very details on the chemical forms of mercury. Um, we're still in the testing stages of that instrument, but uh, it's looking very promising, looks, looking like it works quite well. Um, we're hoping to use that uh, on a major national mercury experiment in 2011. Well, this work absolutely requires a team. I can't do it all myself. And my group, we publish, I don't know, six or seven or eight papers, publications a year. And I'm the first author on maybe two or three of those. And my students are publishing great, great studies on this work. I help them, hopefully. Um, but we have graduate students who are getting their PhDs, often in atmospheric sciences or in chemistry. I have undergraduates. I have under UW Bothell undergraduates who have been in majoring in our environmental science program. Uh, and these students are doing everything from testing instruments in the lab, taking the instruments out to our field site, sometimes flying in the airplane, sometimes climbing up onto the towers on Mount Bachelor to fix sensors. Um, that's the fun part. And then we get the data, then we have to figure out what it means. That's the really fun part, because sometimes when you're, you are, have a data set that you've spent a lot of time and made sure it's a really good data set, and then you dig into that data set and you discover something from that you're the first one in the world to discover that. It's a very, very exciting feeling. When you, it's a very powerful feeling. You know something that no one else in the world knows. And then you publish it and you tell the world about it, and that's kind of the fun and excitement of doing science. So let's see, graduate students, we have undergraduates, um, I have a full-time technician, uh, we have postgraduate, postdoctoral fellows as well. So typically my research team is anywhere from six to eight people with a mix of those, those types of students involved. Most of our funding has come from federal agencies. Uh, when we first started, this was, if you will, curiosity-driven research. Nobody thought about the implications of it, and we just wanted to see if we could detect this. So this was really uh, supported initially by the National Science Foundation. And I should say the National Science Foundation has been a very steady funder for us, and we've been able to successfully compete uh, for funding through writing proposals with the National Science Foundation. Uh, in the last five years, or last seven years, though, EPA, NOAA, and NASA have also been funding us, partly because they're what we call the mission agencies. They have a specific interest in a particular problem um, in the environment. Obviously, EPA's goal, protecting the environment for the United States, and they've been very interested in this problem to understand how much pollution comes from somewhere else to add to our own local loading of pollution. Uh, NOAA is interested because of the climate implications. It turns out that there's a lot of interaction between what we study and climate because dust and particulate matter has a very strong climate impact. Ozone is a climate gas. Um, and again, because of this rapid development going on in Asia, we know that they're going to be, they are becoming one of the largest contributors to the greenhouse problem as well. Uh, NASA is interested because of the connections with seeing things from satellites in space. We use a lot of different satellite data. So we've been funded by all of these agencies, um, and uh, fortunately we've been pretty successful in getting funding for this, which has allowed me to support the graduate students, undergraduates, and technicians, and all this. It's, it's very expensive work, I should say. And I think uh, I added it up, we've, we've uh, brought in about four, five million dollars over the last 10 years of funding to support all of this. And one of the things we saw early on was that a lot of times, or we had a hunch, I should say, that the pollutants a lot of times would go over our heads, higher elevation in the atmosphere. 
So in 1999, we started out by using a small aircraft that we were able to use as part of the National Science Foundation pool of aircraft. Uh, and we did an experiment, we called it FOBIA, had a great acronym, um, stood for Photochemical Ozone Budget of the Eastern North Pacific Atmosphere. And we were able to get funding from the National Science Foundation for that work with the aircraft. And we flew that aircraft, again, right off the coast of Washington, where we expect to have very clean air, except maybe when, these, when the winds are blowing these pollution across the Pacific Ocean, then we would expect to see traces of pollution coming out of Asia. And we did those flights. We did about a dozen uh, flights where we flew the aircraft from sea level all the way up to about 30,000 feet. And sure enough, we detected pollution coming out of Asia probably on five or six of those flights. So it's not every day, but it's episodic, and it depends on what the winds are doing and what the weather patterns are doing. <clears throat> and again, we found these same traces of these pollutants of things that are from gases and aerosol particulate matter from industry and from vehicles and from desert dust and from a whole mix of sources. And one of the things we try to do is to sort out how much different sources contribute on different days. So we used the National Science Foundation aircraft in 1999. <clears throat> um, but because we were able to identify these pollutants coming at higher elevation, I wanted to find an aircraft that we could use that would be available locally and that would be cheaper to operate. And so in, starting in 2001, we made contact with a flight school up in Everett called Northway Aviation. And we were able to make a deal with the flight school to rent their plane with their instructor pilots. That was good. I didn't want to fly the plane. And they allowed us to make some modifications to the plane so that we could put our instrumentation on that plane. And we were able to use those plane at relatively low cost to, to do these flights where we flew from sea level up to about 20,000 feet. And we've used those planes, the plane from Northway Aviation, probably on 50 days, which is a lot. That's a lot of data to get and relatively, relatively inexpensive. Uh, cost compared to the National Science Foundation plane. And we've used that plane in 2001, 2002, 3, 5, and then 2006, and also 2008. So we've really made a great use of that local plane. Uh, and in the process, we've also partnered with our community. And I think this is National, uh, Foundation, National Science Foundation dollars that ultimately get distributed around the community. So that's one of the advantages of this kind of work as well. And then starting in 2004, we said, well, look, we really would like to be able to, at a high elevation, to be able to measure this pollutants all the time. Uh, a lot of people are interested in it. EPA was calling me up and asking me about mercury, which is something I didn't know very much about at the time. Uh, and we started getting into the mercury research as well as wanting to do continuous measurements. So I hunted around for a mountaintop site. And we made a few false starts there in the beginning, but eventually settled on a mountain in Oregon called Mount Bachelor. You've probably heard about it. It's a ski area. Uh, it's at 9,000 feet at the top and made contacts with the ski area and asked them if we could start to use their, their summit station to put some instruments in. They said yes. We got our foot in the door. Initially, we had just a couple of small boxes. Um, but eventually, we have a lot of instruments there now, and we have a continuous suite of instruments measuring carbon dioxide, ozone, aerosols, mercury, uh, radon, weather. So we have a whole bunch of information that's being generated, and that information is coming downloaded uh, every hour to the, our website, which is part of the UW Bothell website. Um, and we're able to look at any given time, we can look and see what the pollution levels are at 9,000 feet. And based on a lot of different kinds of information, satellite information, weather data, we can gauge how much of that pollution is coming from different source regions. Well, first I would say, first thing we've learned, mercury is very complex. <laughs> it's probably the most complex uh, of the pollutants that we study. Um, it's emitted by industry, but it's also in emitted by nature. Uh, it gets into the ecosystem, but it doesn't stay there. It can be, be re-emitted. So sorting out how much mercury is being emitted today versus how much is due to emissions from 50 years ago is a very complex problem. We don't understand the chemical forms of mercury. There's a whole lot of uncertainty in, around what we're trying to uh, study. And hopefully we can make some progress on that so that we can reduce the uncertainty and, and better understand the policy implications. 
Um, first, you should know that there is a local component to mercury and there's a global component. If you have a large local source of mercury, like a power plant or perhaps a cement factory, that can contribute to what we call mercury deposition. Mercury in the rain and deposited to the surface of the earth regionally, maybe within a region of 100 kilometers, 50 miles around a power plant. But on top of that, there's a global, global contribution. And that global contribution is really contribution from everybody's sources around the world. Well, again, it turns out that using coal in Asia is a very large contributor to that global pool of mercury. So we've uh, both detected that mercury as it's traveled out of China to the Pacific and all the way over to Washington State, uh, but then it mixes into this global pool and ultimately, if you will, rains down more or less uniformly throughout the Earth, all over the Earth. Well, dust is another word we use for particulate matter. And particulate matter has very clear health impacts. When you breathe it in at high concentration, there are health impacts from asthma all the way up to different kinds of cardiorespiratory effects on the body. Um, EPA has standards for particulate matter, and so dust is one of those components in there. Um, what we've found is that, especially in springtime, there is pretty much a persistent low-level dust coming out of deserts and from pollution in Asia. Uh, now again, that what that does is it adds to the burden of pollutants and then we add our own pollution to that. So it's the sum of those two that we are ultimately breathing in. And what we found is there can be actually quite a bit of what we call interannual variability, vari variability from one year to the next. We can have a high dust, dust year over the Gobi Desert, which means we get a lot of that dust over here in the western United States. We can have a low dust year over the Gobi Desert and not so much coming over to the United States. And in a high year, though, we will get as much as 20 or 30 percent of the, st of the EPA standard coming over. So if your standard is this much, this is the allowable level where you have health effects here, you're already taking up a third of it by someone else's dust coming in and blowing in on the wind. So that has a very important policy implication. Well, probably for me, the most important thing, uh, the most important thing to do in science teaching is to convey the enthusiasm of generating original results. Uh, science isn't about memorizing data or formulas or numbers. It's really about a method, and it's about asking questions, developing hypotheses, coming up with an experiment, and going and do that experiment. And I think one of the most exciting and fun parts of being a scientist is that aha moment when you, you really do know something that no one else in the world knows. Now, now when you go out there, you have to convince other scientists that you know it and that you're correct, and that can be challenging sometimes, a process we call peer review. But I think if I can convey that in my teaching, I think like I've succeeded. Now that said, students have to learn the rules of chemistry and the Avogadro's number and the equilibrium constants to get to that point where they can design experiments and really do good science. Um, so I, I like to think that I'm able to help convey some of that enthusiasm of being a scientist. It's a really fun job. That, that I, should, I would say that to anybody who asked me. Well, we have a great future of science at UW Bothell. Um, we have several uh, very interdisciplinary majors already here in uh, environmental science, environmental studies. Uh, we're in the process of just started a new science and technology program, which I'm one of the first faculty members in. Um, we're developing a climate science degree. We're developing a lot of new initiatives in science. Uh, the legislature has uh, funded the first step in our new science building, so within a few years there's going to be a new science building here on campus. And our administration has clearly made science a very high priority. So I think we have a great future here, and uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing lots of science students here.